feeling targeted. Dozens of cases of attempted extortion and a rash of crime in Peel region. Tonight, a string of arrests. Good evening. Brampton's mayor says the incidents are terrorizing the community, specifically South Asian business owners. Nearly 30 separate cases under investigation, many involving multiple bullets being fired at buildings. CTV's John Musselman is live with tonight's top story. John. Well, Michelle, it's certainly a frightening situation for the businesses that have been targeted and Peel Regional Police set up a task force to try to crack down on this. This video posted on social media shows what is going on. A Brampton exotic car dealership shot up in December in what police allege is linked to an extortion racket targeting South Asian businesses. And it happened again last month. A bullet smashed through the front window at Nawab Motors. This family-owned business has now installed steel plates behind the glass for added protection. You know, the first time it happened, obviously it was scary. And then it happened again. It makes it even worse. Um, but yes, I don't know how to control it. Things are just getting worse and worse. The original police say they are now investigating 29 separate cases of extortion in the Brampton area. The businesses that are being victimized are South Asian owned, but vary. Uh, they include, and they're not limited to, restaurants and bakeries, trucking and transport companies, independent used car dealerships, and jewelry stores. More than 20 companies have each reported receiving extortion calls or WhatsApp messages demanding they hand over $1 million. At least six of those have refused to pay and have had their businesses shot at. No one has been injured, but Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown says it is terrorizing the community. I can't tell you um, how heroin, heroin it was to get phone calls in the fall um, from families that were terrified, business owners that were terrified, um, expressing uh, a complete uh, level of uh, desperation and dismay describing what it's like to have your uh, family residence or business shot at or to be the victim of, of arson. Peel police say a search warrant was executed at a Brampton home on January 24th. It resulted in the seizure of firearms, ammunition and cash. Five men have been charged. It is alleged these extortion attempts have links to gang leaders in India. Back at Nawab Motors, staff say they are relieved to hear arrests have been made. Still, they have hired overnight security as a precautionary measure. And Peel police say they know there are likely other victims out there that may have been afraid to come forward, but they want to hear from them so they can crack down on these cases. Reporting live in Brampton, I'm John Musselman. I'll send it back to you. Thank you, John. Staying with crime in a story that shocked an entire community. Last summer's killing of a mother in Leslieville, struck by a stray bullet in the middle of the day. Two men have since been charged in the case, and tonight, word of a third suspect in an investigation now expanding beyond the city and country. CTV's Janice Golding is live with more. Janice. Hi, Nathan. Yes, this is a case that saddened and shocked Torontonians. A 44-year-old mother of two young girls shot by a stray bullet last summer, and now police have revealed information about a new suspect in this case. Carolina Hubner macuret was on her way to lunch last July when she was struck by a stray bullet near Queen and Carlaw. There was a physical altercation between three males that we believe was a robbery, and it escalated into violence. Two men were arrested on homicide-related charges shortly after the gunfire, and a woman who worked at the nearby supervised consumption site was charged with accessory after the fact. And now, seven months later, police have identified another suspect. 19-year-old Ahmed Ali is wanted for manslaughter and robbery with a firearm. These three people, we believe, were involved in the drug trade and had an altercation as a result of that. An investigative lead in a murder case, but not a long-term solution for this Leslieville neighborhood, say community advocates. The well-documented fact is, is that street dealers deal fentanyl in front of that health center. Investigative journalist Derek Finkel lives near the South Riverdale Community Health Center, which has housed a supervised injection site since 2017. Since then, Finkel says overdoses have tripled and... Violence, assaults have gone up 60%. Around, uh, around in the immediate area around the center within 200 meters. I see the sign, it says no cash left on premises overnight. Is that to deter that? Yeah, we've gone cashless over the last, since the last break in. There are also concerns for local businesses. Nigel Fick owns Culture Athletics. He says he's dealt with four major break ins over the last year. With over $60,000 of stolen property and damages. Out of the four break ins, we've got two confirmed connections with clients of the CTS. 
It's so disheartening. Fix says when he was at Queen and Jones, a three minute drive away, he never dealt with one break in. Businesses are at risk. A woman was murdered. Like, what more needs to happen for there to be some sort of acknowledgement? that there is a significant issue here. At the news conference this morning, police declined to talk about the health center, instead focusing on the murder investigation, indicating that a Canada-wide warrant had been issued for Ahmad Ali. Uh, since we've identified him and, and we've done background checks, we re realized he had left shortly after the murder. Police allege Ali fled the country to Somalia shortly after Hubner Makaret's murder before he was identified as a suspect. Police say we do not have an extradition treaty with Somalia, so they are encouraging uh, Ali to surrender himself to authorities or to have his family encourage him to turn himself in. Reporting live, I'm Janice Golding. Now back to Nathan. All right. Thank you, Janice. Elsewhere, Toronto police have identified the man shot and killed in the West End early yesterday. At around 1.30 in the morning, emergency crews responded to the sound of gunshots on Lansdowne, just north of College. When they arrived, they found 18-year-old Isaiah Younger outside a home. He was rushed to hospital and died of his injuries there. Two people were rushed to hospital this morning after a fire broke out in a Scarborough high rise. The two alarm blaze erupted in a second floor unit of a building on Carabob Court. That's near Birchmount and Shepherd. Firefighters were able to extinguish the flames as paramedics transported a woman in her 30s to a burn unit with serious life threatening injuries. A man in his 20s was hospitalized with minor injuries as investigators figure out just what sparked the fire. And straight ahead, you know him for his skills on the ice. Why John Tavares is facing off in court. The Maple Leafs captain's battle with the CRA. But first, here's a live look outside. Another day with above normal temperatures and sunshine in the middle of winter, though it feels like spring. We could even set a new record high on Friday. Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Jessica. This abnormal winter season that we're having continues, and we're looking at another really beautiful day tomorrow, starting off sunny, and then the cloud cover rolls in. This is ahead of a low that's making its way out of Colorado, hence the name Colorado Low, that will bring some rain as we head in towards our Thursday night through to Friday. But for today, we're still holding on to a relatively clear sky. Some clouds will roll in a little later on. We're sitting at four through Hamilton, six in London, six in Windsor, six in Goddard. We are well above the seasonal mark again as we head in towards the end of our day. Through the islands over towards Pearson, around 2 degrees, a bit of a wind chill tonight, minus 1. Again, the seasonal average is minus 9. Coming up, a full look at your long-range forecast. Nathan. All right, thank you, Jess. Coming up, sparking an illuminating conversation. Have you noticed this new skyscraper downtown is creating a lot of conversation? We shine a light. At Toronto City Hall, a brief break from budget talks as the mayor and council turn their attention to a long list of other issues. From speed to crime, there's a lot to tackle. CTV's Raheem Ladani joins us live with more. Raheem. Michelle and Nathan, good evening. There were a lot of items on the docket today, and Council is moving forward on a couple of them. Everything from the process towards dealing with red light camera tickets to protections for small businesses. The next time a camera flashes, sending you a red light or automated speeding ticket, pleading your case won't happen inside a provincial court, but instead by the city's administrative penalty system, just like a parking ticket. This greatly simplifies and, and makes clear what the rules are for everybody, and it also uh, stops us from clogging up the court system. It's much more efficient. The unanimously agreed upon changes take effect in November and will apply to all 300 red light cameras and 75 automated speed cameras in the city. Those two systems currently cost $16 million to operate and generated nearly $70 million in revenue last year, though the operating cost could jump to $50 million if a new system and more cameras are added. I don't think that that is going to delight the public I think it's going to make it a situation of, while well, government is watching me, there's something around every corner. Also approved by Council Wednesday to hold a summit for solutions against theft on small businesses. Toronto police say break and enters have already increased 33% compared to this time last year. Every morning we are coming to the store, we are afraid because the glass was, is broken and somebody came into the store. Business owners say thieves are not only damaging property, but targeting credit card machines, costing them thousands of dollars. They took these visa terminals at about 3 in the morning, and by 3.45, they had them up and running on some other Ethernet network, probably at their house, 
and we're processing $500 refunds at a time. A costly crime businesses hope the city can crack down on with a plan to be presented in the final quarter of 2024. Council will move ahead and meet again tomorrow before looking ahead to next Wednesday. That's when the attention will shift squarely to the upcoming 2024 budget. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. Michelle, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Raheem. The Toronto Public Library is making progress restoring services following a cyber attack in October. The library says public computers are now available at all 100 of its branches across the city and reservations can be made online. Printers still aren't up and running and the website is not fully operational. Users still can't access the catalog, search or your account features. And registration for summer Camp TO programs is now officially underway. There are spots available for 30 types of camp programs at more than 140 locations. Children between the ages of 4 and 16 have access to a variety of programs such as arts, outdoor sports and games, science and swimming. You can register through the city's website. Access to timely health care is a priority for many families. And in Durham Region, people are asking what's happening with plans for a new hospital. Development on the site in Whitby seemingly stalled. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris is live with more. Siobhan. Well, it was a previous government, but the promise for this hospital in Durham region goes back to 2000, uh, almost nine years now. And we know that there has been a stall in progress. The town of Whitby now is hoping that putting some public pressure on the government will make the difference. It doesn't look like much now. 50 acres of scrub and tall grass near highways 412 and 407 in Whitby. The vision is for this spot to become a new hub of health care for a growing Durham region. But the cash to get planning going is nowhere to be found. For two years, we have been patient, but we simply can't wait any longer. Whitby is putting pressure on Queen's Park for a $3 million grant to start the design process. The province recommended a new hospital for Durham way back in 2015. The facility could take a decade to build worrying as lines for care get longer. New families having children. It's children who are, get sick. It's seniors who also are experiencing time and delay where they're sitting within our emerges and within the hallways before they can even get a bed. Lake Ridge Health anticipates it will need to more than double the number of hospital beds it has to meet demand by 2041. If our hospital system can't keep up with the demand now, what will happen when our population grows? 20 minutes down the highway, the mayor of Pickering agrees the region badly needs a hospital. I uh, happen to respectfully disagree with uh, Mayor Roy in regards to where it should be. While a panel chose the Whitby lands as the best spot for a new hospital, in part because of its proximity to many major highways. I think Pickering uh, will be the largest municipality in Durham and uh, deserves its own hospital. Mayor Ash thinks the province is right to take its time. It's not just about three million planning grants. It's a, it's a commitment of about a billion dollars. And uh, there's also a requirement to have a local share. A spokesperson for the Minister of Health recognizes Whitby was recommended as the preferred site and says they'll work closely with Lake Ridge and partners on the next round of planning grants for this project to deliver more convenient and connected care. The mayor of Whitby just wants some kind of answer. Is it a yes or is it a no? Is it this land here or is it going to be somewhere else? With people's lives at stake. Well, the campaign that Whitby launched today will involve billboards, social media ads, posters in doctor's offices, and appeal to Whitby residents to write directly to the premier. Reporting live from Whitby, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan and Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. Premier Doug Ford met with Alberta Premier Danielle Smith today as she defends a recently unveiled suite of policies around gender and sex ed. Smith posted a photo from a breakfast and conversation she shared with Ford at his Toronto home. Ford's office said before the meeting that it would focus on areas where Ontario and Alberta agree, like removing the federal carbon tax. Officials said Alberta's proposed new rules on gender-affirming care and pronouns would not be on the agenda. When asked about the policies this week, Ford said his government was, quote, leaving everything alone. He was convicted of leaking national secrets to international criminals. And for that, former RCMP official Cameron Ortis was sentenced to 14 years behind bars. CTV's Judy Trin has the details. 
Cameron Orta sat expressionless as he was sentenced to 14 years in prison. The former director general of the RCMP's National Intelligence Center was found guilty by a jury of leaking classified information to criminals linked to drug cartels and terrorists. We thought this conduct was deserving of a sentence that far exceeded the sentence imposed by the trial judge. In explaining why he decided on a sentence half the length of what the Crown wanted, Justice Robert Moranger called Ortis an enigma, praised in no uncertain terms for his work ethic and intelligence, and that there was no tangible evidence of a motive presented at trial. The judge took into account the four years Ortis spent in jail and on house arrest, waiting for trial, and 26 letters of support from family and friends. The Crown is appealing the sentence, while the defence will fight the conviction. He's very optimistic to to continue the appeal and pursue this. He stands by his innocence. Uh, the fact that the jury couldn't hear a lot of his defense obviously still bothers him. The defense said he was working to lure criminals to use an encrypted network so authorities could monitor them. Because the trial dealt with top secret information from Canada's Five Eyes partners, the foreign agency that authorized Ortis's work could not be named. It wasn't just orders on trial, this was the first time Canada's Security of Information Act was tested in court. That a jury came back with these convictions um, says something, I think, very effective about our justice system that can hold to account those that decide to breach some of the most fundamental obligations they have. The defense has already put forward an application for appeal and will be seeking bail for Cameron Ortis, something that the Crown will oppose. A hearing date has yet to be set. Judy Trin, CTV News, Ottawa. In the Middle East, Israel has rejected a ceasefire offer from Hamas, pledging to defeat the enemy. <laughs> Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said today, we are on a path to total victory, and victory is within reach. He insisted only total defeat of Hamas will ensure Israel's security. Hamas, which Canada considered as a terrorist organization, offered a truce in Gaza for four and a half months. During that time, all of the remaining hostages would be released, and Israel would withdraw its forces. An agreement would also be reached on an end to the war. But the Israelis have said there is no way Hamas can stay in power in the territory. In Ukraine, six regions across the country were attacked. At least five civilians were killed and almost 50 others were injured. The strike hit at least three major cities, including Kyiv. Two power lines were damaged, knocking out electricity to about 20,000 households. It was the first significant power outage in the capital this winter because of airstrikes. Ukraine's armed forces says they intercepted 44 Russian drones and missiles out of 64 that were fired. Prince William has returned to his royal duties for the first time since his father announced his cancer diagnosis. William handed out state honors at Windsor Castle today. It was also his first appearance since taking time away to care for his three children while his wife underwent abdominal surgery. The king is stepping back from public duties to focus on getting better. It's a happy ending to a story that caught the attention of people around the world. A pod of whales trapped in ice off the Japanese coast appears to have broken free. About a dozen orcas were spotted by a local fisherman yesterday. They were bobbing up and down in a tiny gap surrounded by ice about one kilometer from shore. It did not look good, but officials now say the big mammals have escaped. It's believed the whales were able to free themselves as gaps in the ice grew. Maple Leafs Captain John Tavares is dealing with an off-ice battle against the Canada Revenue Agency. The fight over a contract he signed in 2018. CTV's Sean Lethong explains. Signing with Toronto as a free agent back in 2018 made John Tavares a much richer man. Now the Leafs captain is in a fight with the Canada Revenue Agency over millions in bonus payment. According to an appeal filed recently in tax court, the CRA says Tavares owes over $6.8 million in unpaid taxes and $1.2 million in interest dating back to 2018. I think that the CRA takes a large-scale position and, and throws the book in a lot of uh, their assessments, and it's incumbent on taxpayers to file the disputes such as a notice of appeal in tax court. Jason Rosen is a tax lawyer who says that Tavares has a good chance of winning this appeal. 
In the appeal, it says Tavares was paid a salary of $650,000 U.S. in his first season in Toronto, but he received a bonus of $15.25 million the day he signed, part of a seven-year contract worth $77 million. Initially, over $2 million in taxes was paid at a rate of 15%. The appeal saying that at the time, Tavares was a resident of the United States as he played for over a decade in New York. The money went into his New York bank. The appeal pointed to Section 16, Subsection 4 of the Canada-U.S. Tax Treaty, which says that an amount paid by a resident of Canada to a resident of the United States as an inducement to sign an agreement relating to the performance of the services of an athlete may be taxed in Canada at a maximum of 15%. Court documents say the CRA then reassessed Tavares in the fall of 2022, ordering him to pay at a rate of 38% on the bonus plus interest. There was an option between 15% tax and playing for a team that offered that versus any Canadian team that's offering a 45% tax rate or higher. That uh, is a clear choice. We contacted KPMG, the firm representing Tavares in the case. They would not comment as the matter is before the courts. Sean Lee Thong, CTV News. Tavares and his teammates will welcome Dallas to town tonight. Nylander to Riley, shoot it, scores! Tipped in front by the captain! Toronto's coming off a 3-2 loss to the Islanders Monday, and tonight's game won't be any easier. The Stars have won four in a row and are tied for top spot in the Central Division. The Leafs are in fourth place in the Atlantic. Chris gives it to Wara. Grady, and the two is good. Meanwhile, the Raptors finished a six-game road trip tonight in Charlotte. The Hornets have lost eight straight games. Toronto is 1-4 and four on the trip so far. They will host Houston at home Friday night. The Raptors are currently 12th in the Eastern Conference. Whatever happens, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is going to be a very well-paid young man. A ruling is expected any time in his salary arbitration case. The Jays' first baseman is asking for $19.9 million. The team has offered just over $18 million. Regardless of the outcome, it will be the highest annual salary awarded in MLB arbitration history. Coming up, a bright addition to Toronto's skyline. A new skyscraper makes a colorful statement, eye-catching to some, too much for others. The Tower Talk, just ahead. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, airbags and vehicles save lives, and they're generally very safe. But a Belleville family says they were shocked when their airbags went off without warning simply because they shut their car door. I'll have my reports just ahead. And no surprise, really, with your forecast, more sunshine and warm weather on the way tomorrow. But we're watching for increasing cloud into the afternoon, so the kids will be able to dress maybe in some lighter layers. But we're going to have to watch out for a system on the way set to impact us on Friday. Coming up, I have a full look of your long-range forecast. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. There have been several airbag recalls over the past two days involving airbag sensors that could cause the safety feature to work incorrectly. Airbags have been mandatory in Canada for 25 years, and while they're generally considered very safe, problems can happen. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. Pat. Thanks, Nathan and Michelle. The family from Belleville say they were about to go for a drive and they put their children in the back seat. When they closed the door to their SUV without warning, the airbags in their car went off. Shelly and Brandon Daigle of Belleville were on their way to a family dinner in December when they loaded their two girls into the back of their 2016 Nissan Rogue. When Brandon shut the front door, all the airbags on the driver's side deployed. I didn't even know what happened. It, it literally sounded almost like a gunshot. All you heard was my kids screaming and powder everywhere. Brandon says he didn't close the door with any more force than usual and says the airbags went off instantly. And I heard my kids screaming, so I opened my door, and that's when I saw the airbag sheet, and I just panicked. Shelly says the loud bang frightened her children. My daughter was like, Mommy, what happened? Mommy, what happened? And I was like, it's okay, baby. She's like, the car is melting. The car is melting. The 2016 Nissan Rogue has been under recall in the past for an airbag issue, but not for unintended deployment. An investigation found the SUV was not moving at the time and there was no impact, but the Daggles were told the SUV is not under warranty, so the $9,000 to replace the airbags and their $1,500 car rental would not be covered. Their insurance claim was also denied. We're still paying for a car yeah, that we don't have. 
When CTV News contacted Nissan, a spokesperson said the case was still open pending a vehicle inspection. The company later said, Customer satisfaction is of the utmost importance to Nissan Canada. We will cover all repair-related costs as well as costs pertaining to their rental vehicle. That was great news for the Daggles, who will now have their airbags replaced and car rental covered at no cost to them. From the moment you guys took it over, it was like... Everything happened so quickly. Thanks, CTV, for helping with our problem. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you Thank so you. much. And there are currently several airbag recalls happening involving different car brands. If you're unsure if your vehicle is affected, you can check for any recall on the safety recalls database that is operated by the Government of Canada. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. There's a new bright pop of green in the Toronto skyline, and you can see it right behind us. 160 Front Street West with TD as its primary tenant. CTV's Beth McTonnell has the story, including why the city is taking a second look at the lighting. Toronto's night skyline is turning on brighter and greener. It looks really good, and it definitely stands out compared to the rest of the buildings around it. After nearly five years of construction, TD Terrace stands 47 stories tall. The new skyscraper on the corner of Front and Simcoe Streets has vivid exterior lights and signs with the bank's logo atop its crown. What are you thinking when you see all this? TD. <laughs> all, I, all I'm thinking is TD. The illuminated building can be seen for kilometres away along the Gardner Expressway, even in the reflection of buildings below. While not everyone is overjoyed with the view from home... We have a problem with the lights, that there are too many lights there, like too many colours. They should stick to maybe less number of colours. Many find the structure an attractive addition to the city. It's better than the same old grey and just lights adds a little bit of pop. The colours up there look really good. I'm not sure if it's all green, but from down here it looks like a beautiful gradient. I think it's nice. I think it's beautiful. I think it's very um, neat for Toronto to kind of explore different architectural designs and lights. The tower is a collaboration between TD and Cadillac Fairview, and so was the lighting, says TD, along with the architect and a sign design consultant. It can change to multiple colors, the square panels too, these for Black History Month. TD saying in a statement, TD is proud to continue our long-standing tradition of investing in Toronto. The light levels, number of activations and degree of change is regulated by the City of Toronto. The bank says most of the time the lights won't change color and will be static with a gradient from green at the top to white at the bottom. I just can't help but think all the different architecture and design options and, and this is what we went with. The city says its tall building guidelines provide guidance on the balance of decorative lighting with energy efficient objectives, protection of migratory birds and management of artificial sky glow. Telling CTV News it is reviewing the lighting on the tower. In the past year, Tanya Levendovska has watched various downtown towers rise. Big buildings okay, but... Why is it green? Like, can't they, like, make it low-key or something? Like, I think it's too much. Colorful buildings are common in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Tokyo and Dubai. Over the decades, Toronto's skyline has kept evolving, with vast changes from the 1930s, 1960s, 1990s to today. In recent years, the CN Tower, Rogers Centre and others have been bringing colours to the night sky, now TD Terrace. It's absolutely gorgeous, it's stunning. Loving it up close, Noah Johnson becomes somewhat mixed, seeing this view northwest of downtown. From this angle, it kind of looks like an eyesore. Eh? Toronto's skyline, does it need more colour then? Or less yeah, color? yes. Now that that green is there, I think it absolutely needs more colour. Because if there was colour across the entire skyline, that would be amazing. They'd be almost be an... Art, like artistic. A possible projection into the future. Beth McDonnell, CTV News. Well, it sure stands out. I can't help but thinking all of our file footage on the Toronto skyline suddenly dated now, right? It's got to include that building. I know it changes so much seemingly every few years, yeah. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Is the weather going to change a little <laughs> or are we sticking to this sort of mild stuff? It is. It's sticking to what it is. We're looking at temperatures getting really mild into the end of the week. We're likely to break a record on Friday set back in 1938 when the skyline looked very, very different. Uh, weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. 
We're looking at lots of colors on the temperature map. We have the yellows, a little bit of green, but that's more so south of the border. Here we're holding on to this mild air. We're at four through Windsor, two in the city of Toronto, Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay, everybody experiencing this warmth and it's not going anywhere as we head in towards the end of the week. Tonight, we're dropping down to minus one. It'll feel like minus three. The seasonal average is minus nine. The, the pattern continues. Really, everybody is kind of experiencing some of this warmth. Now, as we get into the day tomorrow, London likely up to 10 degrees. The seasonal average is minus two. We'll be at about six here in the city through Waterloo. They'll be at nine. Everybody experiencing this warmth. We have kind of two lows that have made their way through one, or well, one that's on the way, one that's kind of making its way through now that stayed through areas north of us up towards Sault Ste. Marie and kind of made its way across uh, northern and central Ontario. But there is that low. It's a Colorado low that's been kind of slowly making its way in, set to bring some rain as we head in towards the end of the week. But for tonight, just a few light clouds out there. Getting into our morning tomorrow, we could see a little bit of sunshine. And then we're watching for increasing cloud throughout the day. So your morning commute, your evening commute, they stay dry. It's as we get through the overnight that things start to change. That line of showers kind of rolls through right after midnight will kind of carry us through to the early morning hours. The chance may be a spotty shower for that morning drive. Heavier, though, for areas through Owen Sound, Perry Sound. In towards 11 a.m., another line of showers makes its way through the GTA, and then it pushes out. We're likely even to see a little sunshine before the day is all said and done. Temperature-wise, we still hold on even after this low makes its way through to a lot of this warmth, although there is an adjustment that will take place. So your Thursday, well above seasonal. Six for the high, four for the low. We should be at minus nine for those overnight lows, and we are nowhere near that. Getting into our Friday, the seasonal... Uh, Average is around minus two. We are likely to get up to 11. We could briefly reach 12, but regardless, if we pass 10.6 degrees, we set a brand new record. Through the overnight dropping down to three, that cloud cover lifts. We don't really lose much of that warmth as we head in towards our Saturday and Sunday. The chance of showers lingers Saturday, but after that, it's pretty nice and looking ahead to Valentine's Day, if that's your thing. We're looking at plus one for the high, minus four for the low, and not a bad way to get through February. And this is your time to dream with the Princess Margaret Home Lottery with the $7.3 million grand prize featuring an incredible, breathtaking home in King City, a brand new Jaguar I-Pace, plus half a million dollars in cash. Home, cash, car, this prize has it all. There are over 20,000 incredible prizes valued at more than $19 million, including a stunning three. $3.3 million Blue Mountain Grand Prize with a show home plus $100,000 cash. A charming $2.2 million Grand Prize with a show home in Prince Edward County plus $100,000 cash. The $1.2 million bonus prize with a downtown Toronto condo overlooking Lake Ontario and a $50,000 cash prize. And let's not forget the much-loved, world-famous $2.6 million early bird prize that includes a breathtaking Muskoka Lakefront Cottage plus $100,000 cash. Plus, you can win big with cash prizes with the 50-50 and cash calendar add-ons. Every ticket gives you a chance to win a life-changing prize and helps fund life-saving cancer research at the Princess Margaret. Make your dreams a reality. Get your tickets at princessmarketlotto.com or by calling 1-866-631-1234. Nathan. All right. Thank you, Jess. Also tonight, growing blood platelets in a lab, a potential game changer from a team at Carleton University that could one day stem the tide of Canada's blood supply shortage. An Ottawa researcher is working on creating a steady supply of a valuable blood product, platelets. CTV's health reporter Pauline Chan tells us more about his potentially game-changing work. Andrew Harris is a physicist and an engineer, but what he's trying to build right now are platelets. You have an injury or a bleed, and one of the first responses might be the formation of a, a clot, and that's mediated by platelets that are basically going to try and plug that gap and, and prevent further bleeding. Platelets are part of what's collected when you give blood. They're used commonly in treatment for cancer patients as well as other chronic diseases or conditions. The problem is they're hard to stockpile. It's actually a shelf life of seven days is because platelets need to be stored at room temperature. Um, so being stored at room temperature means that they are susceptible to bacterial growth, which means, of course, that they are perishable. So Harris's team at Carleton University is trying to design lab-grown platelets. What we're doing is trying to replicate the environment that platelet producing cells would be in in the body in the lab setting so that they effectively produce platelets in the same way that they would 
um, in the body. The challenge is creating not just the right biological, but also physical environment. So potentially that could be the way that cells are crowded by other cells in their surroundings, and that gives them a unique physical environment that might stimulate them to to produce platelets and protrusions and things like that. So a platelet is basically made by a cell physically shedding off part of its cytoplasm into the, the bloodstream. But that lab process might be five to ten years away from perfecting, so in the meantime, blood donors are still very much needed. Every 60 seconds, somebody in Canada needs blood. Whether that's platelets or other blood products. Pauline Chan, CTV News. The federal and provincial governments are offering up to $13 million to upgrade facilities at Ontario meat plants and abattoirs. The province says these funds will help those facilities increase their productivity and efficiency while maintaining Ontario's high food safety standards. Officials say there's growing demand for Canadian meat products. Uh, projects will also receive monetary support to cover training and engineering costs. As she crisscrosses the globe for her ERAs tour, attorneys for Taylor Swift are threatening to sue a Florida University student who posts details of her private jet travel online. Jack Sweeney uses publicly available information to track the planes of high-profile figures and then share those findings online. Swift's attorney sent a cease and desist letter to Sweeney saying his action posed an imminent threat to their client's safety and well-being. Sweeney said he doesn't intend any harm, and he had a similar standoff with tech mogul Elon Musk after tracking his jet's location. And speaking of Elon Musk, he is helping former Mandalorian actor Gina Carano sue Disney after she was fired from the Star Wars spin-off series in 2021. Carano had faced criticism for mocking mask wearing during the pandemic and for making false allegations of voter fraud in the 2020 presidential election. She was later fired after sharing a post suggesting that having right-wing views in 2021 was similar to being Jewish during the Holocaust. Disney and Lucasfilms haven't commented on the suit. And actor Kevin Spacey will now pay a reduced sum after his 2017 departure from House of Cards. An arbitrator found there were credible allegations Spacey had sexually harassed young male staffers on the show. Spacey was set to pay the production company involved $31 million. That was to recoup the cost of restarting the final season of the show without him. Now, Variety reports Spacey will instead pay $1 million and will support the production's efforts to get reimbursed by insurance. Six years after post-apocalyptic horror film A Quiet Place hit theaters, the official trailer is out for a prequel movie. <coughs> <coughs> Lupita Nyong'o stars in A Quiet Place Day One. It's set right at the start of the alien invasion of Earth, portrayed in A Quiet Place and A Quiet Place Part Two. A Part Three is also on the way, but the prequel is coming first with a release date in June. Canada's own Ryan Gosling is opening up about his experience playing Ken in the Barbie movie as he appears on the cover of Variety magazine. Variety spoke with Gosling about his Academy Award-nominated role as Ken. He shared his journey of crafting the character alongside Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig. He also said he's open to performing I'm Just Ken at the Oscars, where it's up for Best Original Song. Gosling asked for the Variety photo shoot to take place on the Warner Brothers lot tower in a nod to the 90s animated series The Animaniacs. After the break, paying for necessities today at the price of tomorrow. A new poll finds most Ontarians are more concerned about the high cost of living than saving for retirement. On the next CP24 Breakfast. Interior designer and artist Stephen Sabados returns with some great ideas on how to use colour to transform your space. CP24 Breakfast, up first at 5.30. Desperation and dismay, describing what it's like to have your uh, family residence or business shot at. Updating our top stories, Brampton's mayor says members of the city's South Asian community are terrified as companies receive a rash of extortion calls. Peel police are investigating 29 separate incidents, including six where shots were fired at businesses that did not pay. Five men were charged after a related search warrant was executed last month. These three people, we believe, were involved in the drug trade and had an altercation as a result of that. 
Police have identified another suspect in a deadly incident near Queen and Carlaw last July. Carolina Hubner Makarat was struck and killed by a stray bullet. Two men were soon arrested on murder charges. Now 19-year-old Ahmed Ali is wanted for manslaughter and robbery, but police allege he's fled to Somalia. Greatly simplifies and, and makes clear what the rules are for everybody. And there were a few policy changes at Toronto City Council today. Starting in November, red light or automated speeding tickets can be challenged through the city's administrative penalty system, not provincial court. Council also plans a summit on solutions against theft on small businesses amid rising break and enters. In business, amid new uncertainty for the regional banking sector in the U.S. tied to commercial real estate loans, Canada's banking regulator says the issues facing Canadian banks are manageable. With more, here's Jacqueline Hansen from BNM Bloomberg. The head of Canada's banking regulator says his spidey sense tells him Canada's banks will get through any problems in the commercial and office real estate space pretty well. Peter Rutledge says the possibility of property loan defaults, especially those tied to office buildings, are concerning, but he thinks they are a manageable risk. Meanwhile, in the U.S., New York Community Bank said last week that it would start stockpiling reserves for troubled loans tied to commercial real estate. Its shares have fallen more than 60 percent since then to a 27-year low. Rutledge says he reviewed the U.S. regional bank's filings and he says it doesn't change his outlook for the Canadian banks. The full details of the Bank of Canada's most recent meeting are out and they don't offer any more clarity on when an interest rate cut could happen. In fact, they say based on the data they have, it's difficult to foresee when rate cuts could start. In the central bank's summary of deliberations, the officials say while future meetings will probably be focused on how long rates need to stay at 5%, they're currently still concerned about underlying inflationary pressures. And shares of the maker of the Snapchat app plunged today, nearly 35%. Snap reported its latest results after markets closed yesterday and missed sales expectations. Snap has been cutting jobs and projects to rein in costs, yet it's still projected a far bigger than expected loss for the current quarter. Well, let's take a look at some of the closing market numbers for today. The Canadian dollar is trading slightly higher to 74.28 cents U.S. West Texas Intermediate Oil gained 55 cents to almost $74 U.S. a barrel. And our latest look at Western Canadian Select shows just a slight decline to a bit below $54 U.S. a barrel. As for stock markets, the TSX eked out a small gain of 11 points to end the trading day at 20,969.18. That is the latest in business. I'm Jacqueline Hansen of BNM Bloomberg. Financial experts say it's important to save for retirement, but a new poll shows most Ontarians have more urgent expenses on their minds. The Financial Services Regulatory of Ontario polled 1,000 adults in this province. 81% said they're more concerned about paying for basic necessities like groceries or housing than saving for retirement. 44% said the high cost of living is a barrier to retirement savings. More than half of respondents said they had no idea how much to set aside for a comfortable retirement. As levels of government pledge to speed up the construction of new homes, a CIBC report suggests they may be setting targets that are still too low. The National Housing Agency says Canada needs to add 3.5 million extra units by 2030 to make shelter affordable. But CIBC economist Benjamin Tao says the real figure needed to achieve that goal is likely closer to 5 million additional homes. Even with a cap on new international students, Tao said population increases among other non permanent residents will make that higher target necessary. The business report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. Just ahead, stunning wildlife photos, the best of the best chosen from around the world. Which one took home the top prize this year? The answer in moments. And a reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available as a download every weeknight. And a special how do you do to those of you listening to this very newscast live on News Talk 1010. Top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. They are rare, candid moments, incredible images of nature caught on camera. These are the best of the best from the Wildlife Photographer of the Year People's Choice Awards. 
And this is the top pick, a young polar bear taking a nap on an iceberg. British amateur photographer Nima Sarakani captured the stunning image after a three-day search for polar bears off a Norwegian archipelago. Others on the short list included a Balkan pond turtle in shallow water. The photographer says the dragonfly unexpectedly landed on the reptile's nose with the turtle looking like it's smiling at the insect. Another finalist was this flock of starlings in Rome that morphed into the shape of a giant bird. The photographer spent hours following these birds around the city. And here, two lionesses groom a cub in Kenya. The adults had gone hunting and after returning, called the youngster out into the open where it received a thorough washing. It just looks incredible. Always nice to be outside in nature, isn't it? It is, especially when the weather's so nice mm -hmm. and agreeable. We don't have that same kind of wildlife here, obviously, <laughs> outside in these streets in the city. But temperature-wise, it is beautiful. We're still not experiencing a typical winter type of forecast, but that will change in the long range. But for now, in the immediate, really nice. Heading into the day tomorrow, right around 5 degrees, heading in towards the evening. And then as we get in towards our Friday, we are watching to potentially break a record. If we do get to 11 degrees or exceed 10.6, we set a brand new one. The rain comes in, but it doesn't cool things down. It's not until Valentine's Day that we really start to see things cool off. Jessica, thank you. That's it for us. Be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Natalie Johnson with our next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a great night.